Hello and welcome back to this course on critical learnings on forest and adivasi rights. In this part of the course, we have been unfolding the connections between Forest Rights Act and the other laws that function with it. And in this particular video, we will be focusing on the laws of land acquisition and how they operate in the forests, affecting the rights of forest dwelling communities. We will do this in three steps. First, we would understand what land acquisition means as a conceptual process. Second, we would survey the various laws of land acquisition. And third, we would explore how this legal process is applied in forests and how forest communities are affected. Let us begin. What is land acquisition? What kind of law does it use? And what are the concepts behind it? Land acquisition essentially means the taking of land by the state by force, but via a process of law. The owner of land does not have a choice and must give up the land once the process is complete. It is not a situation where the state is buying land from a person, not a contract between two consenting parties, but a forceful acquisition by the state. Since this is a process involving force and the curtailment of right to property of people as provided for in the constitution and which will be discussed shortly, it is a long and tedious one. There are five principles that define this process. Eminent domain, public purpose, right to property, compensation, and resettlement and rehabilitation. Let us go through them one by one. This power of the state to impose upon and curtail is called the concept of eminent domain. Eminent domain is the right or power of a sovereign state to take private property for public use. It is an inherent political right of the state founded on common necessity. The concept that legitimizes such a power of state is called public purpose. But it has no definition and is usually considered by the courts of being of a very wide amplitude. Over the years, the courts have ruled that anything from housing to business parks would be within the ambit of the concept. The phrase has come to mean anything, anything at all like making of financial districts or even making savings in foreign exchange. With literally no idea of who is the public that is benefiting and which section of the public is being crushed in the process, the concept of public purpose continues to be without meaning, except when the state decides to give it one as per its own wish. The next principle that forms the basis of land acquisition laws is the right to property. Article 300A of the Constitution protects every person's property and states that one cannot be deprived of it without a process of law. And Article 21 demands that this process is a due process, fair on all grounds. The most important of these principles is the right to compensation for it is one of the most realistic outcomes in the process of land acquisition. While right to property is protected, the state retains powers of eminent domain under which land can be acquired. And in such a scenario, freedom of the individual to hold that property is curtailed. Therefore, it becomes imperative that the state awards a just compensation for the loss of that person. Receiving a fair and adequate amount of compensation in proportion to the property lost is one of the most fundamental ways in which freedom to hold property is protected and the power of the state to acquire is kept limited. But even so, acquisition of land, even if conducted in the utmost fair manner, leaves a trauma of displacement that is almost impossible to overcome. 20 million people in the country 
stand displaced by acquisition laws for various public purposes. And 40% of these people are Adivasi and forest dwelling communities. And here comes our last concept of resettlement and rehabilitation. Along with compensation, people facing displacement by acquisition have a right to be properly resettled and rehabilitated. This idea attempts to fill the hollowness of monetary compensation for loss of land and instead seeks to give land for land. Now that we know what land acquisition means, let us turn to the laws that govern it. The foremost thing to learn about the law of land acquisition is that there are many different legislations that can acquire land for different purposes. At the central level alone, apart from the popular right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013 there are 10 other legislations under which land can be acquired at the state level there are at least 60 other legislations so the first inquiry in an event of land acquisition should be about the law under which the process has been initiated it could be the national highways act coal mining act or even a state level slum clearance or industrial development law the legislation would determine which process of acquisition would be followed however the most widely debated law for acquisition is the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition rehabilitation and resettlement act of 2013 that came to replace the Colonial Land Acquisition Act of 1897. Taking a leap from its predecessor, the LARR 2013 sought to make the process of land acquisition fair and transparent. While framing the law to focus on rights of compensation, resettlement and rehabilitation of the displaced, the Act provided for something that was unknown to the law of acquisition for several decades. It provided spaces for communities to consent to the acquisition and participate in investigating the impact of the proposed acquisition. As massive tracts of land were being acquired for private companies by the state and were being cloaked as public purpose, this provision of participation and transparency in the process was considered necessary. Likewise, the 2013 Act made a variety of changes to the dominant law of land acquisition. Distributed in three phases, the law provided for a detailed process, ensuring at various levels that the rights of people being displaced by the concerned project were at the center of focus. First, there is a pre-acquisition phase where social impact assessments are conducted and experts groups are created for examination of the proposed project. Second, there is a preliminary process beginning with a preliminary notification in which rights of persons who are being displaced are assessed. And thereafter is the final acquisition process in which awards are passed compensation is given and possession of land is undertaken while also ensuring that resettlement and rehabilitation is in order. The pre-acquisition phase involves processes like conducting a social impact assessment, forming expert groups and deciding whether the proposed land can be acquired at all. At this stage, we must know under which law the acquisition is taking place. Once we know that, we can find out which processes would be followed. Social impact assessment means the study of the ground realities in order to understand the impact of certain actions of the government and to preempt and mitigate any hardships by planning ahead. It is a process of estimating in advance the social consequences that are likely to follow from specific project development, 
particularly in the context of appropriate environmental policy legislation. The report of SIA can help people make a decision about whether they should or shouldn't give their consent to the acquisition. The second is the preliminary process under which consent of affected person is to be obtained. If the acquisition is under LARR, before land acquisition proceedings for a private company or a public-private partnership project are started, the consent of a majority of landowners must be taken. This provision makes it necessary for the party requiring land to enter into a dialogue with landowners and to take into account their objections, putting the people in a position to negotiate. There are detailed rules at the central and state level to frame the procedure of taking consent. This consent under Section 2 is applicable to landowners residing in both scheduled and non-scheduled areas. But in case of a scheduled area, the proviso to Section 2 demands that all land alienation prohibitory laws also come into operation, meaning thereby that permission from the district collector would also be required in addition to consent of landowners. Now, this process of taking consent needs to be differentiated from consent under Section 41 of the LARR, which is specifically talking about land acquisition in scheduled areas. When any land is to be acquired under the Act prior consent of the Gram Sabha, in addition to the consent requirements of Section 2 is to be obtained. It is in the third and final phase where compensation awards are given. It is here that the right to property as per the constitution materializes. The LARR provides for a wide variety of benefits that must be given to landowners and affected people in an event of land acquisition. The following persons are entitled to receive a fair monetary compensation when their lands are acquired. Owners of land, tenants, sharecroppers, easement holders and any person who has been depended on the land for more than three years. One other significant thing about the provisions for compensation under the LARR is that after a notification called the Removal of Difficulties Order 2015 was passed under Section 105 Clause 3 of the LARR. Rules relating to compensation have to be applied even in cases where acquisition is being conducted under an Act exempted under Schedule 4 if forest rights are being acquired. However, application of this process of LARR is kept at a bare minimum. The schedule of the Act itself exempts 13 statutes from following this process, meaning thereby that a bulk of legislations under which acquisitions take place continue to follow different procedures as per their own framework, which are often arbitrary and follow the regime of the 1894 Act. It is now time to turn to the third and final segment where we understand how acquisition takes place in the context of forests. Land acquisition legislations cannot be implemented in the same manner in the forests as anywhere else because forests behold within them immense biodiversity and the people. Acquisition of forest land has much greater consequences. The 2013 Act, for example, makes it very clear that as far as possible, no acquisition of land shall be made in scheduled areas. And only if the acquisition is absolutely necessary can the process take place. The state needs to demonstrate that acquisition of forest land is the last resort. At least one third of the amount of compensation has to be paid to scheduled tribes initially itself. And their resettlement should happen in the same area, 
so that the tribes can retain their ethnic, linguistic and cultural identity. And if any such acquisition happens in disregard of the laws and regulations, the process shall be treated as null and void. Section 42 is also of vital importance here. It states that in case of an acquisition in a scheduled area, all benefits that people living there will continue in the new place where community is being relocated. All rights and benefits have to be replicated in the new area. So even if the community is being relocated to a non-scheduled area, it is the statutory duty of the state to ensure that all benefits of a scheduled area continue there. And here we need to look at the term benefits widely. Forest rights, rights to minor forest produce, water, grazing and even reservation rights must continue along with all other related rights. It is a complicated area of law and in this video we have barely scratched the surface. We only looked at some of the most glaring provisions of the law, but there are far too many that have been left out. We would highly encourage you to refer to the material provided with this lecture if you are interested in learning more about land acquisition. In the next video, we hop on to the law of environment. Thank you for watching.